This is the cover of the current Time magazine that came out um, this morning. There's a uh, debate in there between Francis Collins and Richard Dawkins. I just mention it so that you can see it. Um, <coughs> As you know, this is, this, this is just one of a whole slew of things that we've been seeing over the last um, six weeks. Wired magazine cover, um, big, pay, big piece in US News and World, World Report on Science and the Soul, um, piece of huge reviews in Times Literary Supplement, um, New, New York Review of Books, and so on. So, um, and some of those reviews you can see outside. Many of them deal with this issue of, they touch on this issue of prayer at least, which Paul Churchland was alluding to at the end of his talk. And we're very fortunate to have somebody here who's actually looked at this sort of issue. This is, this is uh, Richard Sloan, who's Professor of Behavioral Medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. And he does um, research on the relationship between psychological factors and health, including prayer and medicine. And you probably saw outside at the UCSD bookstore, he has a book out there called Blind Faith, um, The Unholy Alliance of religion and medicine, Richard Sloan. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. I, uh, uh, time is short and Roger has asked me to be brief and so I'll do that in my New Yorker style by speaking extremely fast and reducing a 40 minute lecture to three seconds. Uh, I, there was a mention made of the fact that uh, I didn't write Blind Faith in order to make money but that doesn't mean I wouldn't like to. Uh, and so, uh, with the holiday season approaching, I want you all to recognize that it makes a lovely gift. And uh, I want to I answer the question, um, or I want to examine the question, is religion good for your health? And uh, you, you can't possibly pick up a, a popular magazine or newspaper or look at a, uh, uh, on television or hear radio for more than eight or ten days without hearing some story about the uh, miraculous benefits of religious activity for health. Uh, in, uh, within the past two years, Prevention Magazine published an article uh, whose title was How Religious Faith Can Make You Almost Invulnerable to Disease. Uh, the uh, Newsweek had a cover story on science and religion. US News and World Report had a similar cover story. There are many popular books, books by Harold Koenig, Dale Matthews, uh, Christina Puchalski, uh, Jeff Levin, all of which make claims about the, the health benefits of religious activity. And it's not just among the general public. The interest is widespread within medicine, too. Uh, next month, Harvard will uh, have its uh, now annual uh, continuing medical education meeting on spirituality and health. Uh, the North Carolina School of Med uh, North Dakota School of Medicine has, has uh, recently organized a program on prayer and health. Duke has a center on spirituality, theology, and, and medicine. And the George Washington University has the George Washington Institute of, uh, uh, on Spirituality and Health, whose acronym is G-WISH. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in is why is this happening now? And there are a number of reasons which I uh, go over in the book. Uh, we don't have enough time to explore them in, in detail now. But I'd like to at least identify a few. One of them is. Uh, what we've seen over the past 40 years or so, a rise in irrationalism. And uh, the evidence of that is everywhere, but best found on the Amazon website. If you just look at what books sell, uh, among the self-help books, there is no limit to uh, books that are wildly irrational. You, I, I'm sure you don't know who Dr. Doreen Virtue is. I didn't either until I started looking at this. She has, uh, I don't know what her PhD is in, but she has books on angel medicine, fairy medicine, crystal medicine, uh, the, and, of course, they're all the same. The nouns just replace each other in the different books. Uh, she has 100 or so items on, on uh, Amazon. And she's just a mere piker, though, compared to Deepak Chopra, who has 1,000 items that you can buy on Amazon. Books, tapes, CDs, mugs, greeting cards. Uh, uh, the, uh, another reason, and one that I'm, I'm sorry Chuck Harper isn't here, uh, although he's heard me give this talk before, uh, another reason why this issue has arisen now is because of the, ro uh, the role of advocacy foundations and principally the Templeton Foundation. I want to uh, I, I want to make clear that the picture that you heard yesterday is only one picture of the role of the Templeton Foundation. On the Templeton Foundation's website, uh, when I uh, 
was writing the book is the following. The, the, uh, the aim of the Foundation's initiative on spirituality and health is, quote, to document the medical aspects of spiritual practice uh, or the, the positive medical aspects of spiritual practice, the foundation hopes to contribute to the reintegration of faith into modern life. It doesn't say to determine whether there's a benefit. It says to document it, assuming a priori what should be demonstrated. Uh, and Templeton has supported all of the high-profile researchers. I mentioned this briefly last night. All of the books written by proponents of uh, uh, beneficial effects of religion and medicine are indebted to Templeton. All of the authors have received Templeton fu uh, funding. So that's another reason. A, th a third reason is the cyclical waxing and waning of religious sentiment in the United States as epitomized by uh, work, uh, works by sociologists uh, who document uh, the rise, uh, the uh, great awakenings in, in religious sentiment in the United States. According to some, we're in the fourth great awakening right now. And so that may account for some of the interest. A, a fourth is the uncritical media. You just saw a uh, cover of news uh, of uh, Time. You know what? The, uh, on the cover of Newsweek, the, par the sister magazine, so to speak, the cover of Newsweek is devoted to the clash of evangelicals. Uh, in writing the book, I uh, interviewed a number of journalists and was actually startled to learn something that may be obvious to you: that journalists and 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 uh, media conduct polls just the way politicians do, and they want to determine what are uh, the issues that will sell their product. And the biggest issue that sells the product is religion. The second biggest one is health. And so there's a very nice confluence of stories about religion and health for market purposes only. And the fifth uh, uh, reason why there's an interest in religion and health today is the widespread dissatisf dissatisfaction with contemporary technological medicine. Uh, the Times had a great story uh, about the conversion of uh, a, a the, the transformation of a, from person to patient as you enter the hospital. And of course, uh, those of you who have been uh, hospitalized recently recognize that this is a commonly uh, uh, cited observation. You are uh, treated with uh, less concern than you would like. You're treated like a collection of organ systems or even a piece of meat uh, as you uh, become a, a patient. Um, and so, uh, those are some of the reasons, and, and I want, want you to be clear about what's at stake here. This is not just a, 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 a concern with nothing much at issue. The, uh, what's at stake is, at least in the view of the proponents of a connection between religion and health and religion and medicine, is a radical transformation of how medicine is practiced in the United States. Uh, prominent physicians have argued that their aim is to tear down the wall of separation between religion and medicine. They've also asserted that the future of medicine is prayer and Prozac. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, several physicians have recommended that, that physicians conduct a spiritual history, just like a social history, an intake for all new patients, and annually thereafter, a spiritual history. Uh, and, and like so many facets of American uh, society, you can find something from H.L. Mencken that, that epitomize, that captures the, the situation. Mencken wrote, uh, for every complex problem, there's a solution that's simple, neat, and wrong. Uh, uh, nobody disputes that uh, religion brings comfort in times of difficulty, whether it's medically related or otherwise. That's not an issue. I don't dispute that. I don't think anybody should dispute that, whether we like it or not. The question is, can medicine add anything to that? And I think that the answer is probably no. So in the time that remains, I want to ask and answer three questions. Is the effort to bring religion into clinical medicine based on good science? Does it represent good medicine? And even, does it represent good religion? And to anticipate, I think, the, uh, as you can imagine, the answer in all three cases is no. So is it good science? The proponents uh, assert that there are thousands of papers connecting religion to medicine. And if you look in the medical literature, in fact, that's true. But it's an exaggeration, and it's misleading in, in certain critical respects. Koenig, uh, Harold Koenig, who's one of the principal uh, 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 proponents of this position, has uh, written there 1,200 uh, such studies. 77% of them show a beneficial effect of religion and health. Others report the same thing. The question is, are these studies about religion and health really relevant to claims about the benefits of religion to, me to, to health. And I'm talking about physical health, incidentally. I have not looked at the literature on mental health. So if you look at the literature, you can indeed find that there are loads and loads of studies. 
However, many of those studies have nothing whatsoever to do that claims about re health benefits of religious activity. Uh, my colleague Amelia Bajella and I uh, looked at, we, we did a Medline search, uh, Medline's the uh, database of the National Library of Medicine. Uh, we, in the year 2000, uh, for, for all the papers published in the year 2000, we looked at everything that came up when we simply put in the word religion. And the 266 papers were identified. We read all 266 abstracts and determined that only 17% of those 266 papers were really relevant to the proposition about health benefits to religious activity. Well, what were the others about? Denominational differences, Jews versus Christians, Protestants versus Catholics. Those are about religion and health. They have nothing whatsoever to do with the health benefits of religious practices. Some of the others were about medical uh, uh, influ uh, religious influences on medical decision making. We all know that Jehovah's Witnesses don't accept blood transfusions. Others were about health fairs. Uh, still others were about uh, uh, religious convictions as a consequence rather than a cause of medical decision making. Sometimes when you, be, when you get sick, uh, you may become more uh, devout or you may become less devout. So the, the claim that there are loads of studies is true but irrelevant to the, to the fundamental issue. What about the studies that are legitimately related to, relig uh, to health benefits of religious practices? To answer that question, we thought it best to look at the evidence that is cited by the proponents as demonstrating this. And so we examined and read in detail all of the almost 90 papers in two chapters of Harold Koenig's voluminous Handbook of Religion and Health dedicated to Sir John Templeton, uh, a book that's that thick that reviews thousands and thousands of papers. And we read all of the papers related to cardiovascular disease and hypertension, which is the area of my day job. Uh, and we wanted to see how many of them were really solid, methodologically solid and could form the basis of a conclusion that religious practices are good for your health. Let me give you, just to give you the flavor of some of them, let me give you uh, uh, details about one. Paper in Physiology and Behavior in 1991 in which 52 male college students were taught Buddhist meditation and compared to 30 control subjects. This is, this is what the, the handbook reports. Meditation subjects had lower blood pressure at follow-up. That's all the handbook reports. Now, those of you who've gone to graduate school have certainly heard the admonitions, be careful about secondary sources. This is the case in point about being careful about secondary sources. If you look only at that information, you come away with the sense that meditation is associated with lower blood pressure. If you read the paper itself, not just what's cited in the handbook, you determine that there was no random assignment to the two different conditions, the meditation and the control condition. In fact, what the, what the investigators did was they recruited a bunch of college students over the summer, some of whom volunteered to be cloistered in a monastery for two months, while the others simply did whatever college students do over the summer, flip burgers, work construction, something like that. The only activity that those cloistered in the monastery got was walking a mile a day in order to receive food. And so, you know, we could have put you in jail and you would have had lower blood pressure at the end of a two-month period of incarceration compared to what college kids do over the summer. So there are all sorts of problems with self-selection and other uh, prob uh, problems associated with uh, the, a failure to do a randomized controlled trial here. So a great many of the studies that are identified as, by proponents as supporting the, the uh, the claim that religious practices are good for your health suffer from significant methodological flaws like that. The failure to control for confounders and covariates and the other significant problem, the failure to control for, the, for multiple comparisons, the idea epitomized by Robert Park's sharpshooter's fallacy. I don't know, you know who Robert Park is, the physicist who's an ardent critic of junk science. He reports uh, that the sharpshooter's fallacy is when the sharpshooter empties the six gun into the side of the barn, then draws the bullseye. If you, go, if you test hypothesis after hypothesis after hypothesis after hypothesis, sooner or later you're going to find something that achieves statistical significance. And then you say, aha, there it is. That shows that religious practices are good for your health. So when you eliminate the papers that fail to have significant methodological, uh, that, that when you eliminate all the papers that have methodological flaws, out of the 89 or so papers in that chapter, four were methodologically sufficient to justify claims about 
uh, uh, the health benefits of religious practices. So the evidence on a scientific ground, the evidence that there is a, a connection between religious devotion and religious involvement in better health is extremely weak, weak and inconclusive. Were all those papers in a referee journal? Yeah, so most of them were in referee journals. What about, what about those four? What, what did you think of them? The four, were, the four were reasonably sound, and one of them was about meditation. You know, they're not, not huge samples, but, but it's four out of, out of 89 or so. And uh, uh, e even some of the, f let's say that the four, I, don't, I haven't looked back at this in a, in a while. The four, let's say they were, they were solid, but they're only four. So on, on, the, on science. Excuse me, if you want to ask a question, could you wait till I get a mic? Because it just doesn't go on tape. It's pointless. So, so the question, so I think the, the, science, the answer to this question is a good science is clearly no. It's not good science. The evidence is weak and inconclusive. Is it good medicine? Uh, Koenig writes, do religious beliefs really keep one mentally and, health and physically healthier and reduce the uh, mortality as some claim? If so, the, this finding has major implications for our struggling healthcare system. Koenig and colleagues clearly believe that medicine can be transformed by introducing religious practices into clinical medicine. And the way in which, uh, one of the ways in which they propose to do that is to conduct what I described before, which is the spiritual history. Uh, the spirit, here, here are the questions, uh, some of the questions from one variant. Do you consider yourself religious or spiritual? How important are these beliefs to you? Do you belong to a spiritual community? How might healthcare providers address any needs in this area? Others ask, what can I as a physician do to support your religious commitment? A question that strikes me as rather odd. So, uh, Christina Puchowski, who was one of the proponents of a spiritual history, estimates that it takes about four or five minutes. Four or five minutes doesn't seem so long until you consider that the average physician appointment is 19 minutes, according to the most recent evidence. So, assuming that that's a correct figure, a spiritual history is going to take more than 20% of that time. So, you have to ask yourself, what will the physician not discuss in those four minutes that are dedicated to a spiritual inquiry. Um, that becomes important because there have been recent reports about how easily or how well physicians comply to evidence-based guidelines, for example, for prevention or treatment of chronic disease. To, to refer simply to one report recently published in the American Journal of Public Health, if physicians were to follow all of the guidelines established by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which uh, issues evidence-based guidelines on what constitutes good preventive medicine, they would spend 9.7 hours every day. That's just for prevention. That has nothing to do with treating chronically ill patients. And so you have to ask yourself, what will physicians not be able to do if they're engaged in spiritual inquiries with their patients? There's another interesting element, though, of the spiritual history that I think that has flown below the radar, and I think it's important to to uh, at least examine. In a case report published in JAMA in, the, in 2002, Koenig uh, uh, identifies an elderly woman who copes with her chronic pain by religious ritual. You can ask the question, why can't the chronic pain be treated successfully? But forgetting about that, she copes with it successfully by religious ritual. And Koenig says, keep it up. Now, that seems like a, reasonably, uh, a reasonable comment by Koenig for a successful strategy. But it occurs to me that he says keep it up not only because it's successful, but also because he agrees with this as a strategy. So I've decided it would be interesting to play with this example and consider variants of it to see whether Koenig would in fact endorse them. So would, a young, would Koenig say the same thing to a young woman with Crohn's disease who copes with it by gossiping with her friends? Would he say keep it up? Would he say the same thing to a young man who copes with crippling rheumatoid arthritis by watching pornographic videos? And would he say, no pun intended, keep it up? <laughs> would he say to a middle-aged man undergoing chemotherapy who copes with it by attending Aryan Nations meetings, would he say, keep it up? Now, the, the issue is, if, if the reason why Koenig is saying keep it up to the woman who copes with religious uh, uh, ritual, because he approves it, does he therefore have to approve these successful, although socially questionable, strategies 
that these patients identify. Do we really want physicians to be engaged in, in making judgments, of value judgments, about our behaviors uh, in, in the way that this examination suggests? I think probably not. Uh, physicians should be involved in helping us to solve medical matters and not becoming arbiters of, uh, of values in our lives. There are some other practical questions, uh, ethical questions that arise in, the, in connection with attempts to bring religious practices into medicine. And the three that we've identified are manipulation and coercion, uh, privacy, and uh, causing harm. Uh, let me talk about uh, those very briefly. Uh, in uh, February of 2004, CBS News pub, uh, ran a program on a Colorado orthopedic surgeon who prays with his patients. When does he pray with his patients? Does he pray with them when they come to his office to make a decision to proceed with surgery? No. Does he pray with them when they come to the hospital for routine pre-surgical testing? No. Does he pray with them when they arrive at the hospital on the day of surgery? No. He prays with them when they are gowned and supine on the gurney, ready to go into the operating room, and then he stands over them and says, mind if we say a prayer? He practically has a scalpel to their throat. And he says, mind if we say a prayer? Even, I don't even know if Richard Dawkins would resist, would be able to resist that. <laughs> but we can ask. It's an outrageous manipulation of a vulnerable uh, patient who may be in pain and is undoubtedly fearful. That's an outrageous case of manipulation. So manipulation is one, one issue. Privacy is another. There are many factors in our lives that we can identify as associated with health outcomes that we nonetheless feel are out of bounds for religion. And the best example is marital status. There's abundant evidence that being married is good for your health. You, uh, evidence suggests that you live longer. The cynics in the audience may say it only seems like you live longer. but. <laughs> But we don't expect physicians to say to a patient, Bob, you're a single man, 36. I see that you're not married. And all this evidence suggests that being married is good for you. So I think in the next year, let's make a plan for you to get married. That would be the last time you'd ever see that physician. And it's because, not because we dispute the link, but we, because we regard marital status out of bounds for medicine. For many people, religious practices are equally personal and private. And the third, is, uh, the third ethical concern is actually causing harm. When I started in this field, I was interviewing young women who were awaiting the results of gynecologic biopsies in order to determine whether they had cervical cancer. And I was, while I was interviewing my patient in, in uh, one bed in a semi-private room, uh, the other patient who was separated uh, from my patient only by the usual thin curtain uh, was awaiting her biopsy results. And she was there with her parents and, and, uh, I, and some other relatives. And while I was conducting the interview, the biopsy results for the other woman came back, and they were negative. And her father exclaimed to no one in particular, we're good people. We deserve this. Now, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to, for the father of a potentially gravely ill young woman to say. Perfectly reasonable. But what was the young woman I was, uh, I was interviewing supposed to say to herself when her biopsy came back positive? Was she supposed to say, I'm a bad person. That's why I got cervical cancer. I've been insufficiently faithful. That's why I got cervical cancer. It's bad enough to be sick. It's worse still to be gravely ill. But to add to that the burden of failure or remorse over some kind of failure of devotion is simply unconscionable. But that's what you get when you make claims or even imply that there are health benefits to religious devotion. You automatically suggest that people who fail to recover or who, who uh, contract an illness may have done so because of some religious failure. And so there's significant uh, ethical problems as well. The, the final, uh, so it, it's, it's not good science and it's not good medicine. I don't even think it's good religion. And the best evidence is in today's times. This is the, uh, the report of the, the imaging studies of people who were speaking in tongues. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania took uh, brain images of five women while they spoke in tongues and found that their frontal lobes, uh, the thinking willful parts of the brain through which people control what they do, were relatively quiet, as were the language centers, the regions involving uh, uh, that maintain self-consciousness were active. 
So a few weeks ago, there was another paper published in, in which a similar imaging study was done with, um, uh, I, I believe it was done with nuns who were engaged in ritualistic prayer. And I got a call from Nature inter asking me to comment on this. And my first comment was, so what? Let's investigate what happens in my brains when I'm eating cheese. Something's going to happen. What's the big deal? The big deal here is that these researchers and, and many of the others think that they're going to support religion by submitting it to the tests of science and then determining that, the, that science can validate the tenets of religion. That's why many of the studies that have been conducted, that's the motivation behind many of the studies that have been conducted. And it seems to me that there is a real danger of trivializing the religious experience. There was a paper published in the American Journal of Psychiatry three years ago in which the sense of transcendence, uh, an index which was measured using a paper and pencil questionnaire, was shown to be related to dysregulated to the dysregulation of the serotonin system in the brain. And the, dysregulate, the pattern of dysregulation was identical to the pattern seen in panic disorder. Now, do we really want people who are devoutly religious to think that all there is to their religious experience is the coursing of neurochemicals throughout the brain? Because if so, we can turn it on and turn it off with drugs. We can administer electrical stimuli to turn it up and turn it down. Is that really all there is? Should people who are devoutly religious be satisfied with that? I think the answer is probably no, and I think most people would regard it as even, even atheists, I think, would recognize that that is demeaning to, to the religious experience of, of people of faith. And so is it good science? No. Is it good medicine? No. It's not even good religion. Again, nobody disputes that religion brings comfort to people in times of difficulty, whether it's related to illness or otherwise. We shouldn't dispute that, but what we should question is whether medicine has anything to add to that. And I think to that, the answer is clearly no. Thanks. I just take a few questions? You, you can, yes. It, the, the, this, just a few questions. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, Could you I, stay here? You are. Oh, thanks. I'm Leanne Chikosky at the Salk Institute. I appreciated the, the good medicine and the problems with the interpretation, thinking maybe you've been a bad Christian Jew, whatever. But the last part, I have a bit of an issue with. And I think that if we are capable of registering brain states in various states of religious conversation with something that we know, much like Patricia Churchland put forth with the prairie voles, if we, can, if we can register that with something that's known, our job as scientists, I believe, is to offer that up. And if, it, if that says that it challenges people of faith, you know, that, that's our job. <laughs> I, I, so, so I was agreeing with you and, and, and up until the last bit, I'm like, yes, I think that it is, it is something we should say. And I agree. I, I, I think it is our job. The question is, are are religious people going to experience that as a satisfying account of their religious experience? Or is it going to be seen? There was a paper published in, one of the, in an oncology journal about six or eight years ago called, Can You Measure a Sunbeam with a Ruler? And among the points that the, the paper made was that by using the methods of science to quantify this experience, you obliterate the experience. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to suggest that by understanding that dysregulating the serotonin system leads to a sense of transcendence obliterates for the, for the devout that experience. And it, all, I'm, all I'm suggesting is that it calls into question attempts to validate religious experience by, un, by understanding it through scientific means. So I agree that that's what scientists should do. The question is whether people who are religiously devout should want that to be done. It's a different question. Neil Tyson. Reverend Tyson. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was, <clears throat> excuse me. I was, I was concerned, dare I say disturbed about something you said, quite casually. Um, you got your compilation of articles of, of, of papers from this secondary source, 
And then you did the right thing. You went to all of them to see what justification they served. And you removed 80% of them for just being about religion, but not about the effects of religion on your health. Fine. And then the rest, you cavalierly said, well, you know, 80 papers were just flawed methodology. Well, if they were all in published journals, why are they in published journals? If, the, if you can sit there and say it's flawed methodology, what, is, what are these fields where you can look at a referee paper and say 80 papers are flawed methodology? And I'll actually give an example of one of the most inf Start your two words again. Medicine. That is the field where 80% of the papers, or 80 out of 84, will be flawed. I'll give you one example of one of the more influential papers on religion and medicine, and this was published in the Southern Medical Journal. This actually was a randomized trial of intercessory prayer to the Judeo-Christian God to patients in a critical care unit for, uh, actually a cardiac critical care unit. And what they found in the paper was that when both patients and physicians were blinded to whether they were being prayed for, the patients who were prayed for had better outcomes. I looked carefully at the paper and I noticed several things. One, a number of outcomes were evaluated, and we've already heard allusion to the issue of multiple outcomes, and they didn't necessarily clearly state that they listed all the outcomes they looked at. Two, what were the outcomes that achieved benefit? Was there benefit to total mortality? Why no? Was there benefit to number of days in the critical care unit? Why no? There was benefit to need for diuretics, implying, in my opinion, that the Judeo-Christian God is the God of urine, and that if we repeated the study to say a Muslim God or a Buddhist God or some other God, we could come up with the pantheon of deities to pray for for different conditions. In one study, surely you would find benefit to um, cardiac outcomes, in fact, and possibly even total mortality. In another study, you might find benefit to need for blood pressure lowering medications. This passed full peer review. This is a higher quality than many of the papers that are published in medicine. Um, and this is one of, one of the highest quality of the papers that's been published in this field. Having said that, there are also things that, are, that merit saying here, which are that relig religion often provides both social and practical support which are things of particular importance to the elderly. When I was a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar at the RAND UCLA, UCLA program, the head of the health program at RAND once made the comment that the biggest health problem in the elderly is loneliness. And he based this on data showing that social support is incredibly important to health. And those data are a lot less weak than the data on religion. And religion, frankly, provides one of the relatively few um, reliable arenas that people are motivated to reproducibly go to when they're elderly. And thinking from somebody that I'm close to who suffered the loss of a spouse and who happens to be very religious, the women from the church came over for a month providing practical support in the form of meals, et cetera, during the time of grief. Thinking of someone here at UC San Diego in the National Academy of Sciences who was an atheist, in his last years he married a Catholic woman, began going to church, and found that he continued to go even when she was out of town because although he remained an atheist, which the priest himself said at the time of the uh, eulogy, he felt profound benefit from the social support he achieved in the church environment. So I think to discount the possibility of benefit from purely practical reasons as part of sort of throwing out the evidence of a benefit from religion to, uh, from the direct religious elements of religion to health is probably premature. And I'll just add the final comment in the, in the case of meditation, that there's no reason to think that meditation has anything to do with religion in terms of health benefits. Deep breathing, in fact, anything that improves tissue oxygenation lowers blood pressure. So I actually think it's likely a priori that meditation, if it involves deep breathing, will have benefits to blood pressure. I agree. So let me just make a couple of comments. I have to play the back on slow motion when they replay the tape, so that we can, <laughs> so we can, we can hear that at normal I'm, speed. I'm very impressed. You actually talk faster than I did. Uh, uh, I'm sure that in astrophysics, the situation is the same as in medicine. There are good journals and bad journals. A great deal of the papers that are uh, supportive of uh, religious, the health benefits of religious practices in medicine are published in the International Journal of Psychiatry and Medicine. Now, that's the 71st, according to the Institute for Scientific Information, the 71st most important psychiatry journal. I didn't even know there were that many psychiatry journals. I'm in the Department of Psychiatry. 
that there's, there's 70 others that are better. So that's one thing. The, the, other, paper, the other element of the Bird paper, that, which you just described, the intercessory prayer paper, it's the only paper I have ever seen in which God is identified as a, acknowledged as a contributor. <laughs> Take a look at the acknowledgement section. No, he didn't. No, he, uh, you know, he may sue for being co a co-author, uh, uh, but he is identified as a contributor. Nowadays, people who are acknowledged in medical journals have to sign the release. Yes. Did that take place? No, this was an older paper. It was 1988, so it was before that requirement. So, and I don't think that there, and no one has tried to get a retroactive release that I know of. So, and there was something else I wanted to say, but I don't remember what it is. So. Any other questions? Uh, Oh, my name, my name is Eugene. Um, I have a question about, uh, about the religious experience you're talking about and knowledge of what goes on and how it affects it. Many drug users probably know exactly what they're getting into and what it's doing to them, yet the experience, they seek it. How does that, you know, how does that work? Uh, Just with ask Hunter Thompson. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not... But, sure, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Yes, that's why we have a drug addiction problem. They, uh, I'm not sure what that has to do with, uh, with religious experience. It ruins the experience. No, no, I didn't say it ruins the experience. Far from it. I mean, it, it provokes the experience for a lot of people. The question, I, my concern is that people who are devoutly religious ought to, I think, object to the identification of their experience of the transcendent with neurochemistry. Th that it can be reduced to mere neuro neurochemistry seems to me to be, ob to be objectionable to, to at least some people. Actually, if you think back, I mean, we're actually going back to Aldous Huxley here because he, that was the first use of neurotheology uh, in some of those early books. I actually happen to have the doors of perception here and just on Eugene's point, there is a paragraph here which uh, he says that humanity, that humanity at large will ever be able to dispense with artificial paradises seems very unlikely. Most men and women lead, lead lives at the worst so painful and at the best so monotonous, poor and limited that the urge to escape, the longing to transcend themselves if only for a few moments is and always has been one of the principal appetites of the soul. Art and religion, carnivals and saturnalia, dancing and listening to oratory, all these have served in H.G. Wells' phrase is doors in the wall, which is where the doors of perception phrase, and from, from Blake as well. So the comments we had earlier uh, yesterday from John Smith is about some of the, the, the neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, and those effects, I think, so, uh, are relevant and, and do have bearing on what you've been, what yes. you've been saying. Uh, I, I really got to go. You, you have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, thank you, Richard Sloan. And since we touched on God in the brain, um, that seems to be a natural cue to invoke V.S. Ramachandran, the director of the Center for Brain and Cognition at UC San Diego, and well-known author of Phantoms in the Brain and A Brief Tour of Consciousness, otherwise known as Rama. Switched up. How about now? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not going to talk about God in the brain because we already went over that yesterday. But um, I'd like to make a few comments about some of the other topics that were covered uh, in the last few days. Um, one of them was the, the talk given by uh, Mazaran Banaji, which I enjoyed immensely. In fact, one of the highlights of the conference. And um, I think work is brilliant, and it's precisely the sort of thing that needs to be done in the social sciences. But I would like to disagree, minor quibbles I have with some of the points she made. And it, it's too bad she's not here to uh, defend herself. Um, and again, it doesn't detract from the main points she made. But let's, what she's really studying is cognitive illusions. Something uh, like, for example, the statistical biases in certain directions. You could call them cognitive illusions. 
uh, very similar to what I do with visual illusions. I mean, here is a departure from reality. You see something that isn't, that isn't true. Uh, but when you study visual illusions, you want to ask, why does it happen? And typically, there's a hidden agenda. It's telling you, revealing something about how the brain works, how the visual system works. And that mechanism, which you can figure out by using visual illusions as a probe, in this particular case, is misapplied. You're misapplying that algorithm. So you're using those illusions as a probe to understand what the algorithms are. Now, in social psychology, often this is not done. And that's why Mazarin's talk is an exception, uh, where she was trying to account for these statistical biases, such as women are cooks, or um, African Americans are uh, involved in mugging and things like that. But there is a difference, and, and this is what worries me, and that is, in the case of the example of cooks and women, I don't want to step on any toes here. You see, the brain is essentially a statistical machine. It's a, it's a Bayesian machine. It's looking for correlations all the time. And this is well known. And in fact, in the real world, it's often the case that women are cooks. You learn it from hearsay. You learn it from watching, especially if you're from India. And that's why the brain has learned this. Now, of course, you're going to deny it. If somebody asks you, do, do you believe that women's, only women should cook, you know it's politically incorrect to say this. You'll say, of course not. Or you, you might be morally outraged by this. So this dissociation between what your statistical machine, the cognitive mechanism is doing, versus your intellectual judgment of whether it should be. In other words, the shock value of this result comes from the fact that there's a political aspect to it, namely women should not be associated with cooking, versus the cognitive illusion aspect of it, where they do associate women with cooking. But there's no real paradox, is what I'm saying. Another example, Stuart Anst is a colleague of mine. We're walking on the road the other day. It was a little, little bit dark, walking on the pavement. We heard footsteps behind us, and we looked behind, and there was an African-American gentleman. And suddenly, we started walking faster. And then I looked at Stuart, and I said, this is absurd. You know, this whole institute. And had it been a white Caucasian person, we wouldn't have done that. It occurred to both of us. Now, that's because your brain has a statistical bias, because it is indeed true you're more likely to be mugged if it's, a, if it's an African American. I don't know if this is still true, but until 10 years ago, it was true. So this bias is picked up by the statistical machines in your brain. On the other hand, if you ask me or Stuart, hey, do you believe that they're, they're, you know, they're more capable of mugging and violence than Caucasian white male? You say, of course not, because that's political correctness. That's your cortex kicking in and it's going to say it's not true. Um, I think what would be much more interesting is the converse. If you show that the brain has a statistical machine has picked up certain truths about the world, not absolute truths, but certain truths about the world, and then a cognitive belief you implant in the person, which is clearly absurd, takes over. This would be an example of, of what, an example of a meme, a pernicious meme. You can ask empirical questions and do experiments on memes. In other words, all the empirical evidence is telling you the opposite, and yet one implanted belief by a, by a prophet or by some guru is, overrides all the statistical information. And that, to me, would be an extremely interesting result. In other words, the exact converse of, of uh, Mazarin Banerjee's result. And of course, that, that sort of thing does happen occasionally. And I can give you several examples, but we don't have time to go into that. The second point I want to make is about, completely unrelated, about the anthropic principle. And I wish Paul Davies were, were here to discuss this. And as you all know, the anthropic principle is how come all the constants, physical constants in the world, are so precisely chosen, chosen in quotes, to make the Earth possible, to make human beings possible, right? And, and so on and so forth. And one answer is that there's nothing impossible about all this. It's only highly improbable, right? Another answer is the multiverse hypothesis, which I don't find very convincing. But it's another possible. You were only, only through natural selection, the one universe which had all the constants being correct, I'm here to talk about it. But I like to use an analogy with another form of the anthropic principle, which is you could regard as an even stronger version, or you could say you can use it to debunk or caricature the anthropic principle. And that is the problem of individual human existence. Right? I am here, this is extremely improbable, vanishingly small. Because if my father, when he was having intercourse with my mother, had coughed, right? so a different sperm had fertilized the egg, I wouldn't be here. My brother would be here talking, if that. right? Not only that, if my father's father had coughed, then my father wouldn't have been here, and I wouldn't have been here. And so on and so forth, go all the way back to Homo, one particular Homo habilis, or Homo habilis had not made love to that appropriate female Homo habilis. I wouldn't be here giving this talk. Now, it's very similar to the anthropic principle, except there you're invoking 
particular types of laws and the exact fact, fact that the laws have to be exactly right, here you're talking about a particular sequence of contingencies, which if they had not been exactly right, I wouldn't be here. So here's an example of another anthropic principle. As I said, you can either use it to strengthen the argument or you could use it to caricature and debunk the argument. And I'm sort of agnostic right, on this point. The third point that was raised yesterday was about profits in science and profits in, um, versus profits in religion. And I think it's naughty to compare these two things. In, actually, Joan and I found ourselves more in agreement than we had realized. We started out saying we we're clashing, but in fact, we, were, we are, or I think we are converging to the same point. The difference is that a profit in science, of course, science has its delusional cul-de-sacs, people rewarding each other, funding each other, giving each other medals, refereeing each other's papers. All of this happens in science. There are prejudices. There's what Kuhn calls normal science, which essentially is a system of delusions. And then there's an anomaly that topples the edifice and you start from scratch. But the point is, there is a correction mechanism. You know, if an anomaly comes in, you throw away the previous, or you modify what you had previously. And uh, this does not happen. So for example, if I bring, uh, bring you a triple helix extra crystallography, saying double helix model is wrong, I can explain all the findings, but in fact, this is the correct model. It explains even more. Right? There may be tremendous resistance to this for five years, for 10 years, 15 years. But if the evidence starts coming in and it's replicated, you say, Crick is no longer the prophet. He's wrong. Throw it away. I still respect him. I still, he's one of my heroes, but he's wrong. And I, by the way, I think he's wrong about consciousness, but I'll get to that later. Okay? So I would say that he's wrong about that. So in that sense, there are no prophets. But if I were to say the same thing about, about Islam, and if I say, by definition, a religious prophet cannot be proved wrong. Because if he says, there's 50 virgins up there when, when, when you die, and you do the right thing, I cannot disprove it using the empirical methods of science. This is true of Hinduism, it's true of Christianity, it's true of all religions, not just of Islam. I just pulled that out of the hat, right? So the dogmas of, of, of religious prophets cannot be disproved, cannot ever be disproved. To compare that with the kinds of dogmas we have in science is mischievous, I think, okay? Um, but on, having said that, let, I, I would consent that there are dogmas in science which become untestable, to use the popper's term. Uh, not in principle unt untestable, fortunately, but essentially in the practice of science become untestable. And I'm going to shock everybody by saying natural selection is one such example. I strongly believe that natural selection is the most important principle. Maybe it's, it's the only principle, but certainly one of the most important principles of evolution, right? There is no intelligent design. There's nothing supernatural. There's no other influence. So it's Darwinian natural selection. But the other day I was reading a zoology textbook and it said there's a creature called Fernizona, a desert lizard. And if it sees a predator about five feet away, it squirts blood into the face of the predator to scare it away. And then I said, my God, what possible intermediate sequence could have resulted in this? Some, some, some desert lizard had a little squirt of blood and then more squirt of blood and then it, it didn't make any sense. Now the standard example of what good is 1% of an eye is a bad example as Richard has pointed out, 1% of eyes eye is, is, is very important and can be very helpful. And all you need is a tiny little uh, uh, bias in evolution that will get, get the whole cascade going. But there are, I, Fernizoma is one example, but I can give you dozens of examples, Remora or you know, hundreds of examples. And the standard explanation for this, you, to use Popper's thing, Popper's, raise Popper again, is, well, if you give enough time and if you give enough pre-adaptation, I can explain it. It doesn't matter. So we don't need to know the details of how it evolved, OK? Of course it must have evolved. And of course, this is true. Because for example, whales, the gap between whales and land-living land animals was enormous. People couldn't figure out how it happened until people found fossils with four, whales with four legs, and then whales with two legs, and then whales with just the pelvis. And clearly, the sequence became apparent. That may well happen for Remora. It may happen for Fernizoma. But what I'm saying is, by saying, what would it take for me what would I have to show you for you to then say, hey, natural selection doesn't account for everything? Supposing I bring a creature with a kettle attached to his chest, which I just dredged up in the Galapagos. And you say, well, it's not surprising because, you know, given millions and millions of years, given enough time, given the selection process, you can get a kettle stuck on the head, right? So if you start saying that, it becomes an untestable proposition. But more importantly, it removes the incentive to look for other biological mechanisms that could lead to evolution. So 
without denying the reality of natural selection, right, or the importance of natural selection, Darwin himself recognized this as a principle called sexual selection, which again doesn't contradict natural selection, but is an additional principle he invoked. So by saying everything can be explained completely by natural selection, there are no other mechanisms of evolution, there's a danger of getting into a, a, essentially an untestable proposition. And I'll give you another example. I think brain mechanisms can aid evolution. So for example, we know seagull chicks go for a beak. Normally the beak has one red spot on it. But if you have a beak with three red stripes, as Timbergen showed, the chick goes crazy. Now we don't know why, but it's something to do with idiosyncrasies of the wiring of the chick's visual system. That's why it goes crazy. Now I predict the emergence of a future race of seagulls in the next 10,000, 100,000 million years with, with mothers with striped beaks, right? So this came out of the understanding of a principle of hypernormal stimuli. Technically, it's not even a hypernormal stimulus because it's not a bigger beak or more beak-like. It's stripy beak, which doesn't even resemble a beak with a spot. There's another principle which has something to do with the idiosyncrasies of the wiring of the chick's brain. So that's an example of how you can bring another principle to bear, but it, you, may, you may not have the incentive to do so if you say, well, it's all explained by the, the hill climbing process of natural selection. So I did want to make a point about uh, personal and impersonal God, uh, but I think we'll stop there. Um, so yeah, sure. Microphone. Yeah, I want to uh, add some nuanced features to a comment you made a moment ago. You were reflecting on the, the bias, the, the built-in statistical assessment that your brain makes about the natural world that you don't even control that. It's just working. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's what you're fighting against with any kind of politically correct comment that one would make in the face of it. And I think I remembered making a similar comment during her talk, uh -huh. saying, you know, if it might even be true. And if it's true, that doesn't That's make exactly. it wrong, you know, just because it doesn't fit, fit the prevailing political correctness. So I don't think any of us are in disagreement with that. But what it misses is the possibility, the likelihood, that in many, if not most cases, the brain doesn't know how to do the statistics correctly. And when you don't know how to do it correctly, then you can, it can lead you to a bias that is not direct consequence of the data. So for example, uh, by the way, nor do I know the very recent statistics, but the ones from 10 years ago that cited that a black male uh, is more likely to be the person who mugs you, that's just not true. A higher percentage of black males will, are more likely to mug you than the percentage of white males, but there are 10 times more white people in America than black people. And so that simple factor alone fully compensates for this other, otherwise statistical difference. And the fact is, there are more white rapists in jail than black rapists. There are more white muggers in jail than black muggers. And so that's where then the bias kicks in, because you're not really thinking of the statistics correctly. I would agree with that. Yeah, and just to pick up on the very same point, um, the um, Bayesian um, analysis, uh, it, it, <clears throat> which we think uh, the, the brain really is doing, uh, doesn't pick up on small probabilities uh, and, and um, overemphasizes uh, dramatic events like plane crashes. Uh, you know, if you look at the number of lives lost, lost in the U.S. to accidents, many, many more, you're much higher probability going, getting in your car, right? Uh, everyday, ordinary, in fact, this happened here at the Salk just a couple of weeks ago. Two uh, people were crossing with the light, uh, of, 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 you know, a, a husband and wife, and a uh, elderly woman crashed the red light at, full, at high, very high speed, killed one of them, the other one's in the hospital, right? I mean, and that's right next door here. It could have happened to you or me. Uh, uh, we, we're just not very good uh, on the level of computing global probabilities. We're not very good. And let me make an extreme case of this. Let's suppose that 100% of all the muggings were by blacks. Let's just assume that's, that's obviously wrong. But even if it's 100%, then in fact your case is, is a beautiful example of how your brain, even now, today, is calculating the probabilities wrong. And the reason is that there are probably in San Diego millions, hundreds of millions of times, you know, uh, during the year when blacks are following, you know, other people and not mugging them, right? 
let's just say it's a billion times when that happens. And let's say that there are a thousand muggings, right? So what's the probability that that person behind you was going to mug you? It's like, you know, one in a million, one in, a, one in ten million. It's a very, very small probability. But no, thinking that, oh, all, you know, all the muggings were a bit blacks, that's the wrong number to use. And we're very fallible when it comes to making that kind of deduction. I just want to quickly comment that the brain is not Bayesian, it's associative. And there are many properties of associative reasoning that do not map directly to correct statistical processes. And the other sort of minor point that I think might be worth bringing up is in saying that people are so irrational about some of these behaviors because um, there are many more white people than black people. I think we all know we're going to die. So it's not an issue of whether we're going to die and what the ultimate outcome is. People are worried about whether they're going to die now. So even the arguments about plane crashes, it's a question you could make the argument that it's rational thinking because although per passenger mile, people are much more likely to die in their car than in an airplane, certainly especially for small planes, per passenger hour, you're much more likely to die in a plane. And if you want to calculate it by passenger mile, then the most deadly mode of transportation is the bed where people die all the time without actually making any progress. <laughs> Could you just say who you are? Um, Tony Bell, uh, UC Berkeley, um, theoretical neuroscience. I just want to point out that the brain is neither Bayesian nor associative, but it's something and we don't know what it is yet. <laughs> In other words, there isn't, there isn't a theory of the brain which explains you know, a, a theoretical neuroscience theory of the brain that explains this stuff. There are certain, uh, that explains all the things that we need, we need to understand, that's all. So are you, are you saying we'll, we're nowhere near a theory of understanding the neuroscientific underpinnings of No, I think we're about, we're about five years away. Five, oh. Yeah. <laughs> do, I, do I take this, this is your personal program for when you see your project finishing? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other? Richard, do you want to say anything on this? No, all right. Any other? Okay, so um, let's shift from that to the um, uh, a, a sort of an if not God, then what s sequence um, at the end here. Neil Tyson had a, a, a few other um, thoughts about, if you may, uh, a few other thoughts about um, life in this universe. Uh, the director of the Hayden Planetarium. talk that I gave on day, one, on day one is still in the hopper. Can we just put up the first slide if, it's, if you guys still have it? The talk would have the name Tyson on it. <laughs> or, 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 or grass. Or. <laughs> well, because I, I titled the talk, so okay. I know. <clears throat> this was not my first slide. Uh, <laughs> And just for mood, if we can just dim the lights a little, because I just want to do some reflecting for which dimmer lights will enhance the mood. Nice and music. No, I, we're okay with, oh. uh, without the music. <laughs> oh, they don't have it. Oh, it's not still loaded on the, on the Mac? It was on the... Oh, <laughs> he threw it. Um, it will take me one second to plug in, if I may. That's fine. May yeah. I? Thank you. In the interim, let me just tell you that um, we're already getting some feedback. I'd love to get some more from all of you at some point. We've already had some feedback from Mike Kalishman, who runs the ethics program at UCSD, and also from um, Larry Hinman, who runs the ethics program at um, USD. It was amazing to me that the two people who are concerned with religion and ethics got back some, some screeds very quickly to us, um, uh, looking through the, whether the central questions, which were the, what is the nature of the clash between science and religion, the if not God, then what, and can we be good without God, the issues were the actual ones that people spoke to. <clears throat> and it turns out from their analysis that they were not what was spoken to. We ended up um, implicitly um, talking about what are we trying to protect what are the proposed threats? What do we need to do to overcome the threats? And what are the proposed solutions? And I'll, we'll, we'll post all this sort of stuff on the website later. 
Um, <clears throat> but they had a, a, an interesting analysis here and okay. a description of some of, the, some of the solutions that came up during the, the comments from the various speakers. Pat Church, and if you remember, suggested we hire a PR firm to do better science, uh, science promotion. Um, and, and we need some better policy making, media reporting. Uh, there was a suggestion that Islamic religion needs to be reformed. Um, <laughs> Uh, that children need to be taught the flaws in religion. Um, Richard, is there, uh, does there, is there, is there, do you, do you we, thinking about Mazarin Banerjee's talk, do you, do you reflect on the personal biases that you brought to all of this, all of this business? I mean, I remember the letter to Juliet, for example. I mean, that's well, yes, master. actually, since you mentioned my letter to my well, daughter, is, is Mel Connor still here? He's actually gone now. Oh, I did actually take <clears throat> strong exception to what he said about... Um, my indoctrinating her by telling her Santa Claus didn't exist. The precise point was that I didn't do that. I invited her to think about it. I invited her to calculate. Now that is totally different from indoctrination. And if he were here, I would demand an apology from him. Okay. Well, I'll, we'll pass I that. agree with Richard on that. We'll, uh, my we'll, daughter. We'll pass that on. <laughs> uh, my daughter at age four told me that fairies all are female. And I, <laughs> I said, well, how do you know? What, what, where's, where, where's your evidence? She said, well, they all wear skirts. <laughs> and I thought about it, it's like, yeah, all right. So I said, so what we went out and had lunch after that. So, so, so well, I- What about Scotsman? Scots <laughs> Not everything that wears a skirt is a fairy, but all fairies have skirts, I think was oh, the okay. argument. Right. Uh, but you're right. But, yeah, I guess we could have Scottish fairies, male yes, fairies. I hadn't learned about them yet. They, they, but they, I applauded the, they, they would the be, thinking. You, you applaud the thought, more the wiring that leads to the question, I think. Yeah, that, that would be called Mac Fairy. <laughs> Mac Fairy. Yes. Um, Neil Tan. Uh Thank you for this indulgence. I just I wanted to offer some reflections as the conference draws to a close. A, a, a <clears throat> close. And... Uh, some of these reflections are really questions to put back out to the audience because I don't think they were addressed over these very stimulating uh, uh, two and a half days. Let me first by lead, leading with a story. I grew up pretty much as a nerd kid, although I was bigger than most other kids so that I could kick your butt. I was a nerd who could kick your butt if you tried to slam me into the lockers. So in that regard, I was... Um, uh, I mean, I had the, the soul of a nerd, and for me, that's all I cared about because that was uh, the nerd credentials come from what goes on in your mind. And uh, I attended the Bronx High School of Science in New York City. Uh, we were classmates, well, same school as Steven Weinberg, by the way, uh, a school that has seven Nobel laureates to its credit, all in physics. And so that environment is quite rich, intellectually rich, not because it has great instructors, which it may have, but that's not what distinguishes it. What distinguishes it is what you do in your interstitial time, during study hall, between classes, on the bus, long bus ride home. And you, you're talking about math, you're talking about physics and chemistry, things you had just learned. And so this was my life. And I was, uh, I was quite analytical very early, with very little room for emotion for things, because emotion was kind of irrational to me. Why are you crying? Is that gonna fix the problem? So just, why don't you try to fix the problem rather than crying or getting uh, un uncontrollably frantic. And that's how I was right up to college. And I had this <clears throat> moment in college, this epiphanic moment with regard to my rational mind. And it took place my freshman year. I was taking, it's a, it'll sound simple and meaningless to you. But for me, it was quite meaningful because my life pivoted on that one moment. I uh, went to a liberal arts college, and there, although I majored in physics, but went to a liberal arts college. So half my courses were not physics or math, more than half. 60% was other stuff. One of them was a survey course in art and design. The full year, September to May. We covered everything, uh, illustrations, charcoal, drawing of nudes, um, by the way, I think the 
the claim of the beauty of the naked human body is overrated, okay, just in case you're wondering. Um, and so uh, we built a chair out of wooden card uh, out of cardboard and built wooden, th we just did everything that art and design people do. Well, around October, they brought it, they hauled in this wall of pumpkins, okay? And this is in a beautiful art studio. And we were to draw the pumpkins with charcoal. And so I did that. And there's like 50 pumpkins, the gnarly looking pumpkins, the kinds that, that people didn't buy and were then surely acquired on the cheap for this, for this exercise. So, so I, I became one of the best pumpkin drawers you'll ever, you've ever met, all right? Ask me later to draw a pumpkin for you. I'll be very happy to. And this is just because I felt like the karate kid where he said just, you know, paint fence. It was like, draw a pumpkin. We drew pumpkins for three weeks. <laughs> and I had no understanding of why we were doing this. And I was, I was saying, why am I even in this class? Because that was preceded in the charcoal exercises. They played music and the guy comes up to me and says, draw the music. I said, huh? He says, draw the energy in the music. And this, you can't, I, I, just, I just graduated from the Bronx High School of Science. You don't tell such a person to draw the energy in the music. Energy is MC squared, one half G. I've got equations for energy. You don't draw energy that you hear. And so this, this course was like, what are they, what, what? And I was ready to explode, because I'd say, where, where are they coming from? These are grown up people speaking this way. Don't they understand the precision of how to communicate real life things in the real world? And so there I was drawing pumpkins. And then, week four, after what was surely my 100,000th pumpkin, and they're, they're stacked against the wall in all kinds of angles. And the week four I come in, the pumpkins are still there. And they said, this time, don't draw the pumpkin. Draw the space between the pumpkins. And at that moment, I snapped. <laughs> because, no, think about it. I spent three weeks endowing meaning to pumpkins on a level never have I endowed meaning to such a thing before, and now they are just the boundaries to emptiness. And now I'm to give meaning to the emptiness. And my mind just snapped. I was, I don't know, I was probably looked like I was comatose. And what happened to me at that moment was, my brain did some kind of inversion. It's something snapped, because after that, as I started drawing the space between the pumpkins, I started seeing things I'd never seen before. That's not a gap between these two wooden panels. That is itself a shape. That is a shape, juxtaposed with other shapes. And a, a black letter on a page, yes, it's a black letter on a page, it's also a white page surrounding nothing. And it's the nothing that I'm giving value to. And so all of a sudden, I came out of there being able to speak fluently with artists about what a painting feels like, about how much energy there is in one part of a painting or a, a, a performance or a work of music. And all of a sudden, the entire branch of humanities poured down into my soul of curiosity. I never thought that was possible, but it was there and it was real. And what accompanied that was a level of emotion that I had never previously experienced. Thereafter, I would attend the opera, where previously it's like, what are they singing about? Why, is, why, isn't he why, why doesn't he just kill him already? You know, I mean, that's how I used to approach these things. And now, I'm like, I got to pull out the handkerchief, because I'm getting misty over the emotions that are, are captured in song. And to this day, it remains true that simple things that I used to chuckle at, even, even corny boy meets girl songs in Broadway musicals, I will well up because the song enables me to feel the emotions of the person better. And so my life got different because of this. Now, and I said I'd only be 10 minutes, I'm sorry, I'm taking a little longer, but I gotta get this off my chest. So, so now I'm becoming a scientist. I'm in college majoring in physics. 
I go to graduate school, get the PhD in astrophysics. It's my life love. I've known this since I was a kid. I didn't accidentally land at the Bronx High School of Science. I knew, but I wanted to become an astrophysicist not because I chose it. In a way, the universe chose me. That first day in the Hayden Planetarium at age nine, as a kid, and I looked up and the lights dimmed and the stars came out. And I was called by the universe. I had no choice in the matter. I became a student of the universe with the ambition of one day being one of its participants in research on the frontier of cosmic discovery. And that ambition, that inculcation, stayed with me the whole time. To the point where when you become an astrophysicist, when you become a scientist at all, here's what I'm putting back to you. Because what we used to do, and I regret it a little bit, is you would go on pilgrimages to mountaintops, because that's where your telescopes are. And where is the mountain? The mountain is far away from any city, because cities have lights and pollution and other things that interfere with your views. So by construct, the best telescopic observing sites are far removed from civilization which means it takes at least four modes of transportation to get there. The plane, the train, the bus, the, 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 the all-terrain vehicle. Then you get to the mountaintop. And what do you have to do next? You have to then start going nocturnal. The day is now your night, and the night is your day. And so that's part of the pilgrimage. There's the effort of the travel, and then there's the effort of flipping your schedule and going nocturnal. Then. There's the telescope itself, this conduit to the cosmos. It's a physical, it's a, it's a tube, it's a conduit. And I sit there and I reflect on it. My specialty was the center of the, of the Milky Way galaxy, 30,000 light years away. And so I have my digital detectors, I've got the telescope, it's dark, it's just me on this mountain and the universe. And I look up and I just think to myself, there are photons that have been traveling for 30,000 years. And I'm sort of snatching them from this journey and planting them into my digital detector. And then I started feeling bad for the photon and I said maybe it wanted to continue, but I got in its way. But then I said no, those are probably happier photons than the one that slammed into the mountainside <laughs> that will go unanalyzed and will not, will not contribute to the depth of our understanding of the universe. But so, so there's not only the fact that I'm on the mountaintop, there's the knowledge and the feeling that I'm reaching out to the universe with these methods and tools of science. And then add to that the sum of 20th century knowledge about the origin of the chemical elements, something the chemist would not be able to answer without the help of the astrophysicist. You can't go to the chemist in your high school chemistry class and say, where did these elements come from? The teacher wouldn't know outside of the domain of science, uh, from within the domain of chemistry. That was informed by astrophysics. We can trace the elements. They were forged in the centers of stars, high mass stars, that went unstable at the ends of their lives. They exploded, scattered their enriched contents across the galaxy, sprinkled into gas clouds that then collapsed and formed stars and planets and life. And so, these ideas, these cosmic perspectives, this pilgrimage to the cosmos. There are people who say, this makes me feel small because I need to see the immensity of the cosmos. And I say, no, you're, you're not thinking about it the right way. You're not, by the way, when we opened our facility, I got a letter from a psychologist from the University of Pennsylvania. He had seen our show, which was a zoom out from Earth, and Earth just shrinks to nothingness as you go to the edge of the universe. And he wrote me a letter that says, I'm a, I specialize in the psychological effects of, oh, how did he word it, excuse me, he said, uh, 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 hello, Dr. Tyson, I'm, you know, Johnny Jones, I'm, I'm a, a psychologist specializing in the effects of things that make people feel insignificant. And I thought, bummer of a job, man, is that what you do for a living? <laughs> and he said, and he said, needless to say, your show was the greatest eliciter of feelings of smallness I have ever seen. Will you allow me to conduct a survey on the people who visit your show? And I thought to myself, there's something wrong here, because why does he feel small, but when I look up in the universe, I feel large. 
then I realized the problem was his ego was too large to begin with. <laughs> he came to the problem thinking too highly of who and what he was to begin with. Because then everything that happened in the show destabilized his self-image. Whereas I know that the molecules in my body are traceable to phenomena in the cosmos. And that, and it's our 15 pounds of gray matter that figured this out. There's a kinship with the cosmos that resonates deeply with new age thinking, but I'm not apologetic about that. It's what we find. If whatever we find is resonates with whoever, go ahead, take it. But what I want to know is, I want you got you, we're in one of the greatest centers of neuro, neurophysiology. I want somebody to put electrodes on my head. And when I reflect on our kinship with the cosmos, when I do the calculation that shows that a 15 ton meteorite that we have in the center of the Rose Center for Earth and Space, it's an iron meteorite. When I do the calculation that shows that if you take all of the iron from the hemoglobin of the people in the tri-state area of New York City, you can recover that much iron out of their blood and realize that the iron from that meteorite and the iron from your blood has common origin in the core of a star. Tell me what part of my brain is lighting up because that excites me. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? That it's not simply, as, as Carl Sagan said, we, you know, we are star stuff, but there's a more poetic and I think more accurate way to say it. It's quite literally true that we are stardust. In the highest exalted way, one can use that phrase. And so I feel, and I use words, I bask in the majesty of the cosmos. I use words, compose sentences that sound like the sentences I hear out of people who had revelations of Jesus, who, 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 go, to, who, um, who, who go on their, their, their pilgrimages to, uh, to Mecca. There's some commonality of feeling. I know it. Well, I don't know it. I want someone to do that experiment. Because the day you do, if the same centers in my brain are excited by these cosmic thoughts as what are going on in the mind of a religious person, that's something to know. That's going to be really interesting finding. Because what that tells me as an educator is, let me offer the universe to people. And they'll start taking it in. And they'll start achieving those feelings that they had before. And I don't so much care whether they abandon previous feelings. I've got an offering that keeps growing, that keeps becoming more majestic. When the Hubble telescope was announced that we were going to cancel, oops, that's it. When it was announced that we were going to cancel the Hubble telescope, the greatest outcry to not do that was not the astrophysicists. It wasn't from within NASA. It was the public. It was all over the op-ed pages and the talk shows. The public took ownership of the Hubble Space Telescope because the universe was coming into their bedroom, into their living room, onto their computer. They were a participant on the frontier of, the dis of discovery. And as far as I can tell, if you let them, let them know that it's not simply that we're in the universe, but in fact, given the chemistry of it all, and the nuclear physics of it all, not only are we are in the universe, the universe is in us. And I don't know any deeper spiritual feeling than what that brings upon me. And I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts. Thank you. So I, that's, I had to share that with you. I'm sorry I got all emotional there, but... Amen. Amen. <laughs> Are there any questions for Neil? Any comments? Terry has a comment. Oh, the brain is three pounds. Oh, what did I say? 15 pounds? Sorry. Oh, maybe oh. The whole, is the whole head 15 pounds? Yeah, some head. Okay, so I got the wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> so your head is 15 pounds, your brain is three pounds. Thanks for that correction. So that's brain minus blood, I guess. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, I think uh, Terry had some remarks. So um, I want to pick up, actually, because this is something that actually uh, I had a similar experience when I was um, at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, in my senior year in um, college. 
and uh, saw the Palomar Sky Atlas, which uh, was a deep, one of the early deep space atlases. It was actually taken uh, at the uh, Palomar uh, Observatory, which is just a few miles away from here, by the way. Uh, and it was a similar feeling of, of being uh, part of a much, much larger and much vaster um, sort of um, arena than I could have ever imagined, just seeing that physical evidence. But there's something else that is also, I think, equally important, and that is that when you make a discovery in astronomy, that uh, you see a supernova that's never been seen before, or analyze a, a, a rock from the moon that's never been analyzed before, it's humanity doing that for the very first time. Before that, nobody knew what was in the moon rock. And after that, it's in the textbooks. And you can only live through that moment once. Uh, and I had the same feeling when I saw the picture from the back of Saturn, occluding the sun. That's an image that will go down in history. Before that picture was taken, when Carolyn Porco showed it, uh, she obviously had been I've, sitting I've, on it for I've quite a while. It. I've got it. Uh, when, you know, when, that was, when that was done, this is humanity for the very first time putting itself through our technological capability uh, into a position where we could see things that no human, or as far as we know, no other living being has ever been before. So that, that's a very special moment. And we're living through those moments on a daily basis not just in astronomy, but in biology. It's within our lifetime that we have sequenced the human genome. I once asked Francis Crick if, when they first published that paper on uh, the structure of DNA with uh, Jim Watson, whether it occurred to him that within his lifetime, the structure of DNA, not just the structure of DNA, but the sequence, the base sequence, of DNA would actually be worked out. And he said that it never even occurred to him to ask that question. It was inconceivable because the technology at the time was so far be, uh, 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 so, so inefficient and so far behind what we have now that it, you, you could calculate it be the lifetime of the universe. But it's not just the human genome because now we're systematically sequencing all the genomes, and it's going to get faster. And the reason is that, as with computers that are getting exponentially faster and cheaper, the cost of sequencing genomes is getting exponentially faster and cheaper. And they estimate that within our lifetime, it will be possible to sequence your genome for $1,000. But it's not just human genomes that we're interested in. We're interested in the whole genome of all creatures that live on the earth. And why are we interested in that? Well, we're interested because therein is the history of evolution. And the chimp sequence was, for example, worked out just a few years ago. And that was particularly interesting because it is our closest living relative. And it only differs in its DNA by a few percent. Now, that's a small percent, but it actually translates into millions of base pairs. So there's a lot of differences there. And there's a problem, because if you see a difference, how do you know whether it is a difference on the line descending to humans or a difference on the way to chimps? Well, it turns out there is a way to figure that out. And uh, I learned it at a symposium that was held right here in this auditorium last Friday. It was sponsored by the La Jolla Group on the Origin of Humans, and it was a symposium on Neanderthals. So, Humans and Neanderthals coexisted for uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And in fact, up until recently, uh, we're, uh, in, in, we were living in Europe uh, together with them, I, I presume peacefully, maybe not. But <clears throat> what I learned at the symposium was that an effort is now underway by Savante Pabo to sequence the Neanderthal genome. How could that be? Well, there are bones, and these bones have DNA. They're, 
degraded with time, but even more, making it even more difficult, they are contaminated with human DNA. But it is possible, if you look carefully, to find pieces of bone that have been discarded because it wasn't realized that they were Neanderthal bone, and so no humans touched them or washed them or looked at them. And it turns out that from these samples, you can get fairly good short sequences. And so the effort is now underway to collect enough of these short sequences to completely cover the genome. And so we will know within the next three years the differences between our genome and a species that is extinct. We're going to resurrect an extinct genome. And that will allow us to disambiguate which line the changes occurred on, because our line uh, branched off from the Neanderthals, for example, uh, much, uh, much more recently than that for the chimp. This is all happening during our lifetime. We're going to know the genomes of hundreds of thousands of species. We're going to be able to read the differences and translate that into ultimately an understanding of how it was that we got here. And finally, I think what's, what's missing and actually part of the roller coaster of this last few days for me has been the realization of really how little we know about ourselves and how much disagreement there is, even uh, when we do our best, how much um, ignorance there is and how much humility we need to have in order to be able to make progress. But I think this is a good sign. I think that we have here the opportunity as human beings for the first time. Uh, we have tools and techniques that uh, technology and science has given us. We have ways using brain imaging to study the, uh, the brains not just of monkeys and cats and rats, but also our own brains functional magnetic resonance imaging, and it's going to get better. Those techniques are just the first steps we're taking. And ultimately, I think, will give us a much, much better picture and will be able to help inform us on making some of the decisions that are going to be made. And I think that, uh, speaking now as a former physicist, uh, I'm just going to put out a hypothesis about where we are right now. Uh, <clears throat> so. It's all about scaling. How do you scale up from a family to a tribe, from a tribe to a group, a nation, and a nation to a world? Well, if communication is slow, you know, if you have to go by the word of mouth, you can only, it, it really limits the size of the group that you can actually organize, that you could lead. But that's all changed within the last, again, within our lifetime, communications has made it possible for information to be instantly transmitted across the entire globe. We're basically going through another one of these scaling transitions. Uh, nations was a natural unit when you had limited communication with uh, horses and then trains. But you know, uh, we have the internet now, and I think that is going to have a profound influence on how we organize ourselves. Um, the, the, maybe this turmoil is something we've got to go through as a species to get to a more global form of organization. I don't know how we're going to get there or whether we're going to get there, but in any case, I think that this is a special moment in history. And so finally, I just want to say that uh, coming from a background really which didn't really uh, have a lot of time to think about these issues, it's really filled me with lots of interesting issues and ideas that I think uh, are going to require much, much more thought, effort, uh, analysis to actually be able to uh, figure out how we're going to do this integration, but I really f feel it's important that we do it. And th the single person I think that we have to thank for this, who's really had this, this uh, meeting uh, percolating for, for a long, long time, and who, in a sense, uh, managed to do something that I consider almost impossible, which is to get up people on the stage and be able to have a, a, a discussion and bring out those differences. Um, you know, before this meeting, people would come up to me and say, what's the schedule? What's the schedule? I want to know who's talking when. Well, there wasn't a schedule, and that was on purpose. And it was the reason was that the meeting actually unfolded in real time. It was organized in real time. We didn't know what was going to happen in the afternoon because the morning hadn't happened yet. And I think this is a much more 
uh, organic way of, of searching an area of, of unknown and disagreement than uh, a, a traditional scientific meeting where everything is hammered into place before the meeting. It has uh, been, for me, uh, a real roller coaster in terms of uh, people and ideas. It's been, uh, it's, it's been an absolute uh, feast. And it's not just uh, the people here in the auditorium, I think, who are going to benefit from it, but all of those who will have access to it on the internet, the internet, which was vastly uh, magnify, I hope, the impact of some of the things that we've heard here today. So let's first of all thank Roger for being an absolutely magnificent <laughs> organizer. And also, is, is Ron Zepps here? To the Zepps family, who actually very generously, could you stand up, please? Very generously provided the resources without which we wouldn't have been able to have such a really great program. So, Roger, do you want to finish up with the. Uh... Oh, just a couple of comments. Yes, thank you very much for that. Obviously, thanks also to the uh, Katie and uh, Sherry, and Riley's not here, and to Linda. Thanks to the crews, thanks to the speakers. There were actually, we ended up with 29 speakers in total. Uh, some people spoke more than once. And there's that wonderful photograph that Neil was talking about. Wonderful image. Um, do you actually want to just say a bit more about that? Oh, um, I wanted to, uh, in, in 30 seconds, I just want to alert you. How many? That 30, I promise. Uh, <laughs> I swear it's 30. Um, I teach a program back in New York once a month, third Tuesday of the month, called This Just In. And I spend one hour reviewing the previous 30 days of cosmic discovery as revealed through press releases in those 30 days or through stories that are not yet made into press release but I otherwise had access to. And um, among them are just, uh, I just went to that presentation, I pulled it up because that's where I presented that image of Saturn that Carolyn shared with you. But I just want to show you just a couple of things that have happened in the last 30 days. There's a transit of, can we dim the lights again, please? Of the, the, the International Space Station across the surface of the sun. And it's right there. And this is the space shuttle catching up with the space station in orbit around Earth. And you can zoom in a little closer to that and you can see. And the space shuttle comes in backwards up to it because it opens in the payload bay right there. And so you have to be in the right place at the right time to capture this, by the way. This was September 21st. This is the space station transiting across the surface of the moon. And these are single frames of a, of a, uh, of a, a movie uh, camera. And um, this is the imaging of the famous face on Mars. We just got new images released by the Mars orbiter. And remember the face on Mars? This is a close-up of it. And it is, in this picture, it's right there. And we have a much higher resolution of what's going on. You can kind of make out the face. It's a face. It's a face. Yeah. It's a oh. face if you are a vertebrate, OK? If, <laughs> if, if you're a jellyfish, this would not be noticeable to you. Something else would look like your own species if you're a jellyfish. I have to watch out for that. What do you say the brain was associative? Um, let's skip that. Oh, actually, we, Hubble just discovered 16 new planets. Uh, that's right there, objects in orbit around their host star. Uh, they're on stars in the centers of these circles. And this was the beautiful image of Saturn. Saturn's, uh, the sun is on the other side. You see a little bit of it glistening through the outer atmosphere of Saturn. And that dot is the Earth seen through Saturn's rings. Earth won't venture far from the sun. The sun is behind Saturn right now. And so you're not, Earth goes around the sun like that. You're not going to find it way out here. And so there's the Earth. And you have other specks, some are stars, and others are just simply moons of Saturn. And we get in close to it, and then you can see it there, the, how distant and frail we are. And this is the zone that was spewed forth by plumes that came from Saturn's moon and Enceladus. And the, the rings are very complicated, but in a fun, interesting, and challenging way. Uh, not in any kind of impossible way, and these are just an artist's vision of what the particles look like. And one last reflection on that image. So we get this monthly. This is, this is just the past 30 days. And so this feeling in our heads is there all the time, and I don't hold that feeling uniquely. 
all my colleagues feel it as well, uh, as surely did Carolyn Porco. So I want to thank you again for this conference. <laughs> Um, just one thanks also to the Crick Jacobs Center, particularly Terry for his, his enormous support and back, backing here as well. The, um, I, I won't say much more. The inside the back cover of the programs you have is the Anselm Kiefer painting that I was talking about, which is this. Um, it, you can see that the universe from these paintings and uh, uh, images and from here is plainly a, a big operation. We've got a long way to go to understand what's going on. And the universe in here is a big operation as well. It's going to take a long time before we understand that as well. I'm reminded of one, one line from William James in the Varieties of Religious Experience, uh, in which he was talking about his nitrous oxide experiences. And he said uh, that we should beware of a premature closing of accounts with reality. So we're not closing our accounts with this subject. The conversation will continue. And we already have set some dates aside. Next year, the Society for Neuroscience meets here in San Diego um, from, San, uh, from the 3rd to the 7th of November. So we are having um, Beyond Belief 2 here, same place, November the 1st to 3rd, 2007. And I hope you'll come back. Thank you. <laughs>